Um, and so I'm just going to go uh, straight through this and last, now this is in the way, there we go. Um, so uh, this, the I'm gonna kind of give you the vision piece just to, just to get started. Uh, the vision here is building an Amazon.com for data. So, you know, if you think 20 years ago, we had a very manual way of finding out about books, search and discovery for books. Uh, if I wanted to, I like military history, so if I wanted to find out something, I'd go down to Borders and I'd say, uh, can you find me who's written the best about you? Uh, Ulysses S. Grant or, and, and, and I'd, there'd be a person there who'd worked for 30 years and they'll say, they'll take me over to bookshop and say, here's, here's what we want to do. 20 years ago, Jeff Bezos or 30 years ago, he had this vision that information about books could be by the way they're being used, not the way, not just the way they're being produced. You don't just need to have the ISBN number, the the uh, book name, the author, the publisher, you could, if you could build an ecosystem of users and producers around books, and then of course it grew much exponentially beyond that, you could um, get a much better understanding of, you know, things that were closer to you. And we see this with customer reviews for Yelp and all kinds of other things since then. So, Here's the, what we're trying to do here is essentially fill a need that has been pushed by this evidence-based policymaking uh, effort at the, at the federal level, which has been, how can we use data and evidence? Now, the thought I want you to hold with is we have very little data about data. Data are now the equivalent of books up on shelves that are described by how they are produced, not by how they're used. So we went through over the past uh, three or four years, this process of, first of all, figuring out how to build a library for data. It's, it's a facility, not a library. And um, so the first step in informing this evidence-based policymaking was, can you put the data in some place so that people could come in and use it? Then the second thing is, you have to also create a use for it and a value. And so that was how the training classes that we have built were developed. What we found was that, you know, as we were building these training classes, people would land on the data sets, and these are high quality researchers and government analysts, and they would not know how the data were used. So they'd ask me, and we're working, for example, with UI wage records, I spent my career working with those, I'd say, can you tell me who's worked on it? I'd be the equivalent of the borders guy saying, well, I remember that so-and-so use it. Here's a good book, Here, here's a good uh, researcher you could go and talk to. I did the same when I was at NSF. When I tried to figure out who was an expert in data, I'd go down the hall and ask my colleagues, the equivalent of a borders. So what a what was clear four years ago was we needed to build data about data. What do we mean by that? We need to find out who else has worked with it, uh, what models, what, data, what other data sets have they used, what computer code have they done, and in some sense, what that's going to do is it's going to help address the core issue that we're having in science which is, here's John Ioannidis, who's made his career and, and talking about the challenges with replication and reproducibility of research. You'll see this has over 2.7 million views, right? And part of the issue is, how do you find out what's, what's been going on? So we got funding from Schmidt and Sloan and a couple of other places to, to USCA um, Overdeck to support discovering how data is being used. And then, of course, the Evidence Act got passed, and part of this Evidence Act was this open government. Okay. So the agencies, the 24 uh, uh, 
CFO agencies were charged with providing data about how data are being used. Now, how are they going to do that other than the operational equivalent of reaching out and saying, how to use our data? And that was part of why Nancy and Suzette brought me into OMB to figure out how to use this. So this is what we don't want to do. We don't want to have a reprise of uh, open data under my, a good buddy of mine, Beth Novak, who worked on the Open Data Act, which had a noble goal, agencies should put their data out there. And all you get effectively is a vomit of data. So how can we do better? So that's what we're going to try and do. And these links are on the website. So how are we going to find out all of the wonderful work that Toby Smith has done? What data sets has Toby used? Or alternatively, um, if I'm trying to figure out, uh, Stephanie, nice to see you. You uh, were very influential with the survey of income and program participation. How do you know who uses it? Who's used the SIP? Well, really what we need to do is to read millions of publications and find the data sets in the publications. Once you find the data set to publication link, you can find the topics, the authors, and that then you can use to describe uh, what the value in some sense of the data set is. Now you want to create an ecosystem. That's what Bezos did. It wasn't what he, what the public market, what the private marketplace will do is there's money involved. We're trying to create a public good here. So we're trying to figure out what are the levers. And that's why um, Howard pointed out, you know, these are the players that we're kind of bringing together. And we've got all the moving parts. Uh, we've got all the plumbing in place. What we want to do is we want to build, the, put the two, all these different pieces together. We've got data site, we've got the CDOs, we've got act IAT, we've got all kinds of uh, uh, emphasis being paid. So how can we re read 80 million publications and figure out what the data sets are? So it turns out researchers are pretty useless at citing the publications that they use. Uh, as you are probably aware, fewer than 5% of empirical publications actually cite the data in the references. So they're impossible to find. This is a, I, I'm picking on myself here. So in this paper, the only place that I tell you what data set I use is in a section that's called data and measurement. And a human being reading this can see, oh, she used the survey burn doctrines and she used your metrics. But it's nowhere else. So we think your metrics is important. We think the SED is important, but we can't find out how it's used. So how can we solve this other than sending out emails to people, the equivalent of the borders, and say, how are you using the uh, SED? Run a data science challenge. So that's what we did. And we had 1,600 data science teams who came in and worked with it, and they were able to crack the nut. You can use the semantic context of the way in which an author refers to a data set to be able to pull that information out. So here's an example. I'm using NOAA data here. You take, so NOAA, which is one of our agencies, uh, identified a key set of data sets that they were interested in. This is one of them. It's not something like the American Community Survey that people would recognize, but this is a data set for them. In the test, uh, this is the test data set. They did not know that this was the name of a data set. Uh, the training data set was completely disjoint. And the model found out in these publications, they were able to find that data set name from the semantic context. So from the way in which the authors referred to it, 
out of the text, they were able to pull, this is the data set. What that means is we have the data set to publication dyad. So why is that cool? I'm gonna show you now, okay? So what I'm gonna be able to do is I can create a um, API that has the key pieces of information. So, sorry, I went back to the PowerPoint. I want to show you the, um, the API site. And then I'm going to show you the tools that can be developed. So from that, you can create an API. And the, that API has for every data set to publication dyad. So data set to publication dyad. You've got the topic, the author. You've got how it's produced. And now you start seeing how it's being used. So what does that buy you? Well, um, consistent with Title II. So this is the important bit. We now have, we've, to some extent, we've always had the supply. Now we've got the federal agencies with the demand. So why, did, why was Bezos able to create what he was able to create? Because he was able to identify a demand and fulfill it. We have the impetus of the legislation, the federal agencies generate between 20 and 25% of GDP. There are a massive shock to the market. And so what we're able to produce here is information, for example, about uh, obviously hurricanes are a big deal. This is one of the data sets that uh, Noah was particularly interested in. I can create a leaderboard of who are the biggest users of one of the data sets they're most interested in and link to the publications that they produced. And I can, uh, that this is a very primitive tableau. Agencies can take the API and create whatever they want. Or for example, uh, one of the things that the um, USDA cares about is a very boring data set called rural urban uh, continuum codes which sounds really awful, right? So let me pull you up what that looks like. And you take a look at the way in which uh, USDA represents that. That's about as exciting as a bookshelf, right? What you could do now is find out how they've been cited in publications. And you can have a word cloud that says, my goodness, here's how rural urban continuum codes have been used. It helps you understand disparities uh, for poor youth. And I can go and take a look at that because it, it helps me look at the urban rural uh, differences. I can look at mental health. Rural urban continuum codes are used in this area. Uh, it can help me look at obviously rural areas, but these are ways of understanding uh, the role of cancer and poverty rates. So uh, instead, the point here is, the sky's kind of the limit in terms of being able to describe how data are used. So I hope this is a little bit of a Jeff Bezos uh, moment for you. Um, and really the sky's the limit in terms of how to take that API and make it used. So um, obviously it's not gonna be perfect. So, Machine learning models are not always going to be perfect. Using scientific publications isn't enough. You're going to want to go into the gray literature. You're going to want to enable researchers to correct and update the information. Bezos didn't just put a data inventory in the sky. He engaged the user community with providing reviews. Uh, and 
then they can correct it and create a living piece of input. So I think that's one of the areas in which academic institutions can contribute. But the point here is we have gone from manual approaches to be able to show that automated approaches can work. And now what we need to do is to build the ecosystem. So to close out, that's what the conference is about. And we can talk about that in, uh, later, but we have, we met with the chief data officers this morning. Suffice it to say, they're super engaged. We have GAO coming as well. Uh, Howard's been talking to the publishers. They're really interested in, in building this together. We're talking to researchers tomorrow. Uh, our goal here is to engage with the academic institutions so that we can have all the key parts of the ecosystem together, because that's what it took to build uh, the um, Amazon.com. And that's kind of where we want to head today. So Howard, back over to you.